You're welcome to my channel. My name is Pastor Yemi Omoboyega. I thank you for visiting this channel. Please remember to press the like button. Remember to uh, press the notification button. And remember to share vid this video. It's very important for Christendom, especially for our churches. Please let us share this video extensively. And uh, I'm going to be talking, this may be part one, if it elongates, if not, it may just be one part. But my, I just uh, are moved by the Spirit of God to this morning appeal to our church. So, as uh, I was saying before, I am moved this morning to again revisit the issue of uh, our Christian leadership, as well as particularly church doctrines. And um, there have been a lot of controversies about so many of the doctrines, but the most outstanding two are the tithing and first fruit. And uh, please, uh, this one is a passionate appeal. I'm not, uh, you may have seen my method before, as if, okay, it was too harsh, you know, um, as if I was attacking some leaderships, especially notable ones, or some, but let's, uh, look, this morning, I'm adopting a different approach entirely, because there is no, there, no, nobody wins an argument, and at the same time, nobody is um, nobody is Mister Know All, Know It All. Uh, I have been citing some examples, so therefore, I, I appeal to every one of us: let us reason together, let us reason together in the matter of the Bible and its interpretations, and. And also, let us, there's one thing in law that is called the intention of the law. The intention of the law. For instance, the intention of God for giving us 600 and, I've not counted it myself, I'm told it's 631 laws that we have in the Old Testament. And another preacher says, it's 613. But what I do know is that there are a lot of laws in the Old Testament, starting from even the Garden of Eden. I want to tell you, when God, people don't know that it's a law, but it's a law. When God created us and placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of uh, Eden, what did he do? He said, all these things that I put here, you can eat, except the fruit from the tree of knowledge and of evil and good, you know? Every, that's a law. Don't go there. Don't go there. But before then, before I go, go on, let us pray. Our Daddy and our God, we want to thank you. You are a mighty Father. You are a powerful God, Father. You are awesome. You are you are too powerful. You are just everything. You are too big for us to comprehend. You know, we, you are just too marvelous. Imagine, Father, you gave us your word. And for over 2,000 years now, we have been trying to interpret them. Ah, Lord, you are mighty. You are powerful. You are glorious. You are excellent. You are awesome. The book you wrote to give to us just 2,000 years ago, the book is still shaking the world today. Everybody trying to interpret it to know your intention. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we adore you. Accept our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. In the process, oh Lord, many churches, in fact, churches have divided against churches. Brethren have divided against brethren. Closest friends have become like enemies to one another just because we are trying to know your mind. Daddy, 
accept our thanksgiving for this your greatness in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we appreciate you, we bless you. That in the process of all our arguments, we have committed a lot of sins. Things we shouldn't say we have said. You know, things you didn't even say we said you say. There is none of us who is free from blame. Yet your word, one of your commandments to Abraham was, look, walk before me without blemish and be blameless. Daddy, we really thank you because you are always there for us. Much as we goofed, you always correct us. Yet, in spite of all our callings here and there, you remain God. <laughs> Daddy, accept our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray this morning, let your Holy Spirit that inspired me to come and address this matter again, let this Holy Spirit come down now and give me correct interpretation correct ministration, correct everything so that I will not be enemies to my brothers and to my sisters. I will not be antagonistic of your word. I will not even be uh, a backslider. Every one of us that will be listening, please give us the spirit of unity. In Christendom, we are supposed to unite. Things of these doctrines, doctrinal natures, ought not to separate us from you or from one another. Please help us, Lord, to overcome these challenges. The message I'm going to pass, please interpret them yourself to your children so that we all can reason together and follow your way. At the end of the day, the kingdom of heaven Matthew 6, 3, 3 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness. Every other thing we are pursuing in life will be added. Please, Lord, let us make heaven. Thank you, Daddy. Blessed be to your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. So, brethren, like, as I said, the burden is laid upon me now to say it in all humility. Forget about my previous seeming anger. It is just how passionate I am about the topic. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. We have so many doctrines in the Bible. And many churches, you know, sift out all these doctrines. But what we are saying is that whatever doctrines we are using must be something that is in line with God's intentions or good intentions or intendment for us. And uh, if we don't follow God's intendment, then uh, it leads to so many things. And I'm going to use this tight and first fruit as the example. So that it is one, it, in fact, if there are other doctrines, nobody bothers so much about any other doctrine in the, I mean, any other teachings in the Bible, uh, it's the only one that is near to what we are talking about is the doctrine of marriage, you know, about divorce or no divorce, you know. Uh, that one is also causing a lot of uh, problems, you know, can a divorcee remarry and can divorcee, you know, do this, can they do that, can he, and then so on and so forth. May God continue to teach us in Jesus' name. Now, like I said, when we place a doctrine, and that doctrine, you know, causes arguments, then it means that there is there is a, there is something somewhere that needs to be corrected. Now, I have been a Christian from my let me say from my very youthful age, and like I said, I want to use tithes and first fruits as an example. If you look at it, and all these things we have been taught right from my early days, you know that tithing is a way to bring prosperity to you. If you want to prosper, you must tithe. You must do everything. Let me just quickly say one thing. 
we should separate between giving and tithing. The reason is that tithing is coercive. Giving is voluntary, is free will. And now that takes us to the mind, to the intentment of God concerning this tithing and offerings. And the first fruit. If you look at <clears throat> it, uh, it was Abraham that first paid tithe to King Mexedek. It was Abraham. Orlando. Though there even, it wasn't called a tithe. We need to understand that. Bible did not say it was a tithe. It was much later the doctrine of tithing came up. It wasn't even called a, a tithe at all. It was a voluntary gift because Abraham was the one that says, I will give you a tenth of the spoils of whatever I brought from the war front. If you enable me to free my nephew, that is lot. You see, it was, it was voluntary. That was not even a tithe per se. It was, the Bible did not call it a tithe. But it was later when we say, okay, a tithe is now a tenth of what I mean, as we go, as we went on. But one thing that I want us to understand, the intentment of God for us, right from Genesis to Revelation, is never to put us into captivity anymore. It's a man that placed himself into captivity. We, we disobey the first law there that you shall not eat the fruit from the tree of, uh, I mean, you know it yourself, but Adam and Eve, for whatever reason, they ate it. The reason of deception. They ate it and they were banished from the kingdom of God. Let me put it, the kingdom of God on earth. Yes, that's what God uh, uh, Garden of Eden was. And it is that same kingdom we are still coming back to. Because by the time Jesus Christ would have come back to this world and be the king of the entire world, where there will be no death, no, no sickness, no sorrow, no wahala, no marriage, no nothing. Where are we back into? We are back into the Garden of Eden. So the kingdom of, uh, sorry, the Garden of Eden, Eden actually symbolizes the kingdom of God that will eventually come, where Christ will reign over all. Now, the intention of God is not to destroy us. Even in, uh, he was angry in Genesis 6, verse 3, and he said, my spirit can no longer put up with man for more than 120 years. And that means that very moment he gave 120 years notice to man before his, his anger actually kindled. You see, look at the notice. 120 years of ministrations. He made it known and he said, Noah should be preparing an ark. And, we, and he was doing everything that was needed to be done. But people were adamant, still disobedience. To, he gave us notice even when he wanted to punish us. And after he punished us, he said, God, the Bible says, God repented. He felt sorry for man. And he now said, sorry forever. I will never destroy man like this again with rain again. Then he placed the rainbow. Anytime you see the rainbow in the sky, no matter how cloudy it is, no matter how heavy the rainfall may be, is a, is a sign that God will no longer destroy the world again with water. But you can see, since man fell from Eden, uh, God has been trying to rescue man. Even after the uh, Noah's generation was destroyed and it was only Noah and his family that were rescued, then a new order came. A new generation started coming. So the whole uh, Eden, uh, sorry, uh, the whole of Adam and Eve's generations then were perished. They perished with that flood. But after Noah, we started having a, the second, uh, can we say the second uh, creation? Now, let me put it that way because that was 
continuity. That was the where life began again. And from there, we still kept on sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. And in the process, it got to the point of the laws. Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, and so on and so forth. We violated them all. And it got to Numbers, Leviticus, the Deuteronomy, and uh, just name them. All those books of the laws, the Pentateuch and others. They were all there, and then we ran into, we still continued in our disobedience. And yet, throughout, God was looking for a way to rescue man. So the intention of man, God, is not to destroy us, is not to put us in bondage, is not to put us in captivity, is not is to draw us nearer, is not to drive us away from him. Then came the period of uh, tithing and all that. God chose Levites, you know, those whom he chose separately to be praying, to be doing full-time ministry. And he even gave them the assignment that he gave to those who are not in full-time ministry to to convert. What, What assignment? Even as he said, okay, you are not going to be have any inheritance, landed or whatever property inheritance, but People should give you, they will pay tithes. From the tithes they pay into the house of God, you will now be taking care of yourself. And from there, they were they were doing that to, at a stage. People were not paying well again. And not only that, uh, the people that are being paid to, even the Levites themselves, now refused to pay tithes. That was where God spoke in Malachi uh, 3, 8 to 10, about robbing God. Even the, the you are supposed to pay a, the tithe of tithe, 10% of the tithe of, that was able to put in the storehouse for the poor to eat and for the orphans and for the widows. But people still in this, but again, let us look at all the laws in the, in the Old Testament. If you if you did one evil, they will say sacrifice dove, sacrifice uh, animal. This what keep good that you are hearing to be is part of the process of trying to remove the sin from man. When a man sins, they will heap prayers, you know, confess the, the sinner will confess his sins on the goat and they will offer, you know, they, they release it to the wilderness they, they, to go. All, all just to free us, but Finally, God saw that that would not work. Then, what did God do? God now went to the extent of sending Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who saved us. And it says, uh, Romans 13, verse 9. That's where it says, the fulfillment of the law is in the love of Jesus Christ. Then, Matthew 22, from verse 9 downwards tells us that, look, the summary of Genesis to Revelation is that you should love your God with the whole of your heart, with the whole of your might. And then the second one is you love your neighbor as yourself. Some people are saying to those who are atheists, they will say, oh, uh, I don't offend anybody. I don't wish anybody evil. I'm paying my tithe. Uh, sorry, I'm giving gifts to people. I am housing people. I am doing scholarship. I'm doing good. <laughs> you can see why we cannot be saved by all those things. If you see, they all those ones fell under the second category of the commandment, which is just like it. The first one is you should love your God with the whole of your heart and your mind. And if you love God, automatically you will do number two because you will love your neighbor. As yourself, but if you love your neighbor, yes, it is possible for you to love your neighbor as yourself, but don't love God, it will still not help you. That's just the same thing like the tithe and offering we are talking about. Looks uh, the Luke 11 41 says, You pay tithe, you do everything, you give your arms, you do everything, but you fast, you, you do everything, but you left the one that is greater, which is justice to people. You didn't do justice to people. You didn't help people. You think you are serving, you love God there. 
but you don't love your neighbor as yourself. You see, you can see those, both two of them work together for good. If you don't satisfy both legs, you will not uh, be uh, working towards being a heavenly candidate. That's the truth. You need to fulfill the love for God and the love for fellow men. And then James 1.27 also break down all those things. Now, let's look at brethren. People, when you talk of tithes and offering, people have had issues with it to the point that they keep asking questions. Does God really, is God really imposing things on us? Does God want the life to be difficult for us? When you get to, to the church of God, you see, many people don't go to church because of this cry for money, especially tight, which they tell you carries curses. Malachi 3, 8 to 10. So, up to all those people, even when Jesus was still on, when he has not died on the cross, those things were still valid. But that's why Jesus told them in Luke 11, 41, say, this you would have done without leaving the others undone. But the moment Jesus Christ died on the cross and he said, it is finished, the work of all these agonies, problems, everything is finished. All these rituals, they are finished. All these um, um, pains and all that, they are finished. The, once the Lord has, once Jesus has finished that work, we don't need all those ones again. The love of God, Jesus Christ, has fulfilled even the title, all the commandments. So going back to them is putting pressure or doing everything. And that's why Jesus himself and even in the whole of the apostles that preached in the New Testament, what did they do? All they did was, I mean, Jesus made it clear, God loves a cheerful giver. Everybody also are supposed to not give to God voluntarily. 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 Not all those idea of, oh, if you don't pay your tithe, you will die. If you don't pay your first fruit, all this will happen to you. Or, and then number two, you can see, uh, Deuteronomy 14 actually exposes everything about tithe. Deuteronomy 14, uh, um, uh, 16 to 22, tells us the details, how to use the offerings. Uh, sorry, even when it was being collected or not, now you are not supposed to pay now. When it was being collected, it says it is for the for you to enjoy yourself. It's a ceremonial law. It's a ceremonial commandment. You go to a place that the law will choose, let's say a church like these congresses that we are doing every year now, or annual conventions and all that. You go there where God will choose, maybe your temple, your church. And then when you go there, you eat this food, you buy drinks with it, you, it is merrymaking. But finally, you come back home. Then you give to your pastors, you give to your Levites, you give to orphans. It's not even limited to... Uh, and it was not paid to the church as money. They were even good. They are food stuff. Go and read the Bible yourself. Deuteronomy uh, 14, verse 16 to 22. Please read them. To, even to 28. Please read them. So now, uh, Deuteronomy... Once you read that, you see what purpose it is for. Today now, we are not using it for that purpose. One. Number two, we converted it to money. The only place that was converted to money is say when you are, your loads, your food stuff, they are, the things you are carrying for the ceremony are too heavy. Sell it. And then when you get there, don't give the money to the priest. Buy food again. And then eat and dine with God. Like, you know, swine and dine with God. But we didn't. So today, in the first place, we turned it to money, and the money becomes a prayer problem. And then, not only that, we now invoke Malachi 3, 8 to 10, that carries curses. 
curses if you don't pay. As at then, yes. But today, it is not so. So why do we still put ourselves? Let us just reason together. No quarreling, no, no fighting. Just is a matter now of conscience. And it's the matter of the Holy Spirit, you know. Because there is no a mistake can go on for thousands of years, just like this one. But it can be corrected the moment you know the truth. And say, when you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. If you don't give more, if you don't change, yeah, sorry, if you know the truth and you don't change, that becomes something else before God. Because the Bible says, he that knows the truth and does it not is has committed a sin. And no sin is too small. That's why those who are postulating that it is a sin for you to be demanding um, um, tithes and first fruits from your people. It's like forcing their hands to give money out uh, because it is not commanded by the Bible for today's generation. It was commanded by the Bible then for the people of that time, not for the people of today. Today there are no Levites. We made ourselves Levites. So, the, even the, we neglected the ones that are very important that the Bible says we should. Go and read 2 Kings chapter 12 from verse 4. Read it to me, big down, verse 6 or so. You will see the various offerings or monies that you can collect from the church. Vows, pledges, monies given voluntarily. Uh, church census, they call it. I don't understand what that means. Church census, maybe attendance, whatever. And so on and so forth. But tithing is not there. Even in the old time. Now, the argument has been that, okay, if you don't collect tithe, how do you fund the church of God? That also leads us to one thing. The matter of God is by faith. Faith by individuals, faith by the church. The collection of saints, the collection of the assembly of faith for the saints. Then two, the church that we are talking about is made clear in the New Testament. Jesus, we are the temple. We. You know, while along, it is inside of us that God lives. He doesn't live in all these cathedrals. We have. So we need, we need even less of these edifices that are dragging us to go and make so much, to go and be begging for money to build cathedrals and all that. So we need to equip the people, not the... You can do something just to protect your head, but it's not to give edification so much to the church cathedrals that you don't remember the more important cathedral, the church, the, the temple, the man himself. So you can see all these things, when you look at them, you discover that um, tithing brings hardship. Tithing brings agony to people. When you say they are caused, they come back to the... Tithing brings guilt. It's law. All the laws in Genesis to Malachi, they are all... Their byproduct is guilt, frustration, and discomfort. That's the truth. Because they are not done cheerfully. It's a commandment. But now, when you look at the New Testament, where Jesus has finished the work of our salvation, the intention of God is not to give us all those problems. Many are running away from the church now. It's, that's why the church is not we think they are blossoming they are not really blossoming the number of Christians the number of Muslims in the world they outweigh the number of Christians nobody has disputed that and also our lives have not really transformed with according to the promises they are giving to us those who are taking this tithe let's look at it look at your life my brother you are paying your tithe you are paying your everything is your life better than those who are not paying? Is it? We need, we need to be truthful to ourselves. We need to be truthful. Let's not lie. Things are hard. Whether we pay the tithe or not. Our nation is not even the better for it. When churches were buying over the halls, we think that not knowing that churches were actually uh, uh, making money out of those things. Another thing today is that look at 
some things are happening. I understand. I'm, I've not proved it, but it's just let those who are concerned find out, and then let those who know find out. I understand that some of these businesses that churches establish, like um, schools, like even some hospitals, like some other things that the churches establish, they are not even for the, for the church, even though they bear the name of the church. They are for the leaders. They are personal properties of the leaders. So you can imagine. That is another deception. Because people value those, those things because they think it belongs to the church. And that is why their expectation is that if it belongs to the church, then we should be able to benefit from them. We are not benefiting. So, brethren, tithing and first fruit, they are not for today's dispensation. And then, look at the use of the church, the money. What do church use, use the money for today now? Good example. Two things are happening. Before COVID-19, people like us have been advocating that churches should stop oppressing cathedrals uh, uh, for their followers, their converts, by demanding tax, on uh, uh, church tax, which we call tithe on them, or first fruit. But it is oppressive, it's everything. But now, COVID-19 has come. Now, churches who have large employees have been running into trouble. May this thing not last for long. If it lasts for long, many churches will lay off their staff and the career of these people will be sacrificed on the altar of tithes and offering. The reason is this, but it's from these monies. Some of them will say they don't, but well, all I know is <laughs> it is from these tithes that churches generate steady money with which they can meet their administrative costs. Now look at the implications. The implications are that the workers, full-time pastors, uh, full-time ministers of God, those administrative workers too, workers, all church workers, they might lose their jobs. I pray that it doesn't happen. You can see, but the churches that are not collecting tithes and first fruits before, they are operating within the limit of what they have. Then second, I did mention something which I didn't finish. I said, the matter of God is by faith. How do we fund churches? God will raise men and women who will fund the churches. It may be, there may only be two in the whole church. All you need to do is pray for you to be one of them. That's why I pray to God Almighty. God will make me somebody that can finance a church, at least all churches. If you tr trust that, then nobody to ask for donations is biblical. It's doctrinally right. You can ask, plead for people to donate to the work of God. But whatever they will give will be but don't give them a promise. If you give them a promise, you are luring them. Don't give them a threat. If you give them a threat that if they don't give, then God will deal with them mercilessly. You are threatening them. If you tell them things will be tight for them, if they don't do it, you are threatening them. Let them give what they want to give. Through that, then God can raise special people. So even one of our pastors made mention. Our daddy Gio then in Brazil said he went to a place where somebody came up and said, Look, all the money should contribute, all the offerings. Let somebody count them. I will double it. And he did because he had. It was voluntary. He spoke up and he fulfilled. God can raise men like that. I pray for God to make me somebody like that. So you yourself pray for God to make you somebody. God, churches will flourish without tithe without imposing first fruits on people. So let us stop this idea. I'm appealing, please, because the thing is more serious than we think. When you are oppressing fellow men, God does not want it. It's a sin. When you are saying, you are cursing, you are cursing. 
We are saying what God does not see. God spoke to those people in Malachi 3, the people of those days. When you are saying it is us that is talking to today, modern day Christianity, then you are lying against God. And Bible says no liar shall enter the kingdom of God. Go and check it. No liar shall enter the kingdom of God. Apart from placing yokes upon them. Another offense that, or another guilt that churches have is this. They make, they reel out programs that keeps their people coming to them all the time. They never make room for people to have personal relationship with God. When you put programs on all through the week and weekends, many homes must have scattered because the husband is not paying attention to the, the wife is not paying attention to the husband or children. Homes are being undone because of church programs. This is, this is another area. And psychologically, you have reorientated these people to make it that it is the church uh, programs or all these things that are also more important than their homes. Take note, Eli failed in the home front. Samuel failed in the home front because they had no time to take good care of their children. Then, if churches are occupying the, the couples, so much. I know men don't even attend many things, but we are women. We, all these things are leading to troubles in the homes. Now, look at some of the things that are happening. All these are our annual congresses. From personal experience, if I want to go to the RCCG camp from in Ekiti, where I reside, I need to hold at least for one week or three days or so. I need to hold not less than 50,000 Naira just to manage because I'll carry a car, I'll go with a car. And when I'm going with a car, car will fuel, there will be repairs to do, servicing will be there, even that alone. Then when I get there, I buy food, I, I, I have, a, have a, comm a rent accommodation, I do everything. Look at the, and even 100. It is when you don't have a major breakdown in your vehicle. A major breakdown can take as much as 100 and, or even more than 1,000. And then, not only that, those who are even trooping there, many a time, accidents do occur. People will die, yes. People will die. But uh, we don't need to expose ourselves to sources of death unnecessarily. These programs do expose. A lot of people die on the way. Uh, their souls rest in peace. But many of the journeys are unnecessary. The internet is there now. Conduct these services on the internet. Thank God for COVID-19. We are learning a lesson that with minimum of two, Jesus is where two or three are gathered in my name. Where will I be? Government says 20, minimum of 20 people. is the maximum of 20 people. You can conduct your services. You can pray. And many of the other things that we ought to do, we, we, God, God wants us to do, we don't do. Brethren, tithing and offering is not God's commandment to today's church. Men, go and read the Bible. I, you see, we are not exposed enough. That's why we are gullible. That's why we are linking COVID-19 with 5, 5G technology. Thank God now. I think you've heard that uh, Love World TV is being sanctioned for propagating falsehood that is dangerous to the existence of humanity. Check it out. Let them go and clear themselves. Things we don't know, we say we know. So let's... It's the same thing that is happening. Let us... Just for once, oh Lord, help us. I'm not fighting you now. Let us not fight. Many of you that will listen will say, ah, this man is an antichrist. He's not, I'm not an antichrist. Who am I? I myself am seeking the face of the Lord. But I cannot leave my God. I'd rather be on my own, serve my God, 
than to be led away astray by the doctrines of the so-called organized churches. Because I am the temple of God. God dwells in me and he speaks to me and is always caring for me. So why? why? So it's not even for anybody to say I am a backslider. It's not, that's judgment. You don't judge. Because you have taken yourself to know everything and nobody knows everything. That's why even with the clarity that I still have in all these things that I see or that I read, that I research into, I still maintain my humble position. The Lord, if for any reason I still miss it, please, mercy, mercy, mercy. May God have mercy upon all upon us in the mighty name of Jesus. I can't judge you. You can't judge me. All we need to just be pleading for, if you see that I'm even missing, say, please, Lord, have mercy upon this guy. Just as I'm praying for you, if we miss it, Lord will have mercy upon you. Lord will have mercy upon us in Jesus. So, now, like I was saying, let us follow what the Bible says. All we have been hearing is Malachi 3, 8, uh, 8 to 10. We never heard of Malachi, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 14, 16 to 22, which explains everything about first fruit and tithes. For how long shall we continue to be gullible? And then let me plead with you. Hey, the poverty